afternoon, everybody. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Ian. I'm sure you all know Ian, so I'm not talking too much about Ian, but the one he did, and, and he did many good things in his life, as you know. But one of the very good things he did was to talk to our former executive director at UNEP and to convince him to create GRASP. Since then, he has been working for GRASP in a number of different functions. He has always been very dedicated with a lot of passion, and we thought it, it would be a good moment to simply honor Ian's work to grasp into the great apes. So we came up with that idea of creating an award so that we have also some positive benefit of this. Because just um, honoring Ian is, is great, but at the end you also want to encourage people to do conservation work. So we received um, contributions from UNEP, UNESCO, the Born Free Foundation and Conservation International. And we launched this award a couple of months back and invited young, uh, young um, conservationists in Africa and Asia to submit proposals. We were clearly interested to see what would be the potential conservation impact on great apes, and we were specifically looking at the originality and innovativity of the proposals. So we received a number of really interesting and exciting proposals and looked at those and we're happy that we can announce four winners, and each of them will receive $5,000 for their field work. So I think I will now hand over to Ian, and he will introduce each of the winners, and will tell a little bit the story behind what is the interesting part about the proposal, and why do we feel that this is a great idea and which should be supported. And by starting the, this is the first round of the Ian Redmond Award, we hope that it will continue for many years and we will receive more contributions from potential donors over the coming years. So I thank you all for coming and I hand over the microphone to Ian. I wanted to draw a little on what was happening yesterday and some of the things we learned yesterday and to talk about what we're doing for the next um, 20 something minutes in that context. Because as uh, Johannes said, um, this is the first round of the GRASP um, conservation awards, which were instigated um, to mark my legacy, I was told at first. And I thought, hang on a sec, I'm not dead yet, and I haven't finished. <laughs> but um, putting my name on the award doesn't mean that I can't apply for it, so it's slightly frustrating. <laughs> but um, we have, um, I'd like to, to, well, I'd like to, I should follow Baruti's example. Start by thanking um, I'd like to thank the Arcus Foundation and GRASP and the Jackson Hole Film Festival for hosting us here. It's particularly appropriate, I think, to be here as part of a film festival, because certainly throughout, throughout my work with great apes and, and elephants, uh, filmmaking has played a part. And if there's time, I might tell you one or two stories. I like the way yesterday included some stories, because what makes a really powerful film is usually the storyline. And stories grab people's attentions and draw them in. And again, if there's time at the end, I want to tell you a new way, a new platform for storytelling that will be tied to these awards. So how are we going to, given what we learned yesterday from Ray, that the extractive industries, I knew about some mining um, exploration projects that were funded to the tune of a billion dollars. I had heard about that, that's frightening enough. But to learn from Ray that if you add up all these explorations, actually the extractive industries are spending a trillion dollars, we're up against a huge economic force. The demand is huge, the money available to make more money, because if you put a trillion dollars in, you're expecting to get several trillion out, is huge. So how can we, in all seriousness, stand up and say, We've got a pot with $22,000 in it. We're several orders of magnitude too small. But how can that help confront these big challenges? Uh, what I'd like to weave into this discussion is seeds and matches. Now, Jane, this afternoon, will talk about roots and shoots. Very important combination. But seeds and matches are important too, because obviously you can't have roots or shoots without a seed. Usually you might expect me to be talking about the role of apes in seed dispersal in the forest and the health of the forest depending on there being the right number of apes and elephants and other seed dispersal agents and the health of the planet depending on the healthy forests and why apes are so important in that regard. 
But actually, I'm talking about seed funding. Because seed funding can make a huge difference if that seed is nurtured, if it is enabled. So what we're hoping with these awards, not only is there 5,000 for the project, there's $500 for each of the award winner as a personal gift. They can buy a pair of binoculars, they can buy a laptop, they can, whatever they want to do with it, they can. And put their kids through school while they get on with their project. So it's $500 for the individual and $5,000 for the project. And we have four winners. If some of you are looking at the announcements, uh, not so long ago, we were suggesting there would be two winners, each getting 11,000. But after the applications had been vetted and sifted and we got down to a dozen, I was wishing we had enough money for a dozen awards. And that's been one of the problems. When the award was first announced last autumn in Paris at the GRASP Council meeting, the second GRASP Council meeting, there was $10,000 on the table and they were talking about two awards of 5,000 each. And then Born Free Foundation said, we can match that funding. So this is where the matches come in. If you've only got a small sum of money and you can persuade someone else to match it, and then Conservation International, Russ Mittermeier stood up and said, we'll match that too. So suddenly, the, and then an individual stood up and said, I'll stick 2,000 in. So we have this rather odd sum of 22,000. And looking at the quality of the 12 applications, we found it hard enough to whittle it down to four, let alone two. So we have four awards of 5,000. The ones who didn't get into the top four, because the committee, uh, Inza Kone and Johannes Refish and Serge Witch and myself, we set up a, an attempt at being objective and rating the conservation value of the different initiatives, how innovative they are. Some of them were really important surveys but surveys are not that innovative. They're important, and if any organization that is listening to this or reading about this thinks, hey, match funding, yeah, we can stick another 5,000 in, then all the ones that didn't make it this time will go into the next round of the conservation awards. So it's not a, no, it's rubbish. It's that we can only pick four this time, and you'll have another chance next time. And even if tomorrow somebody said, here's another 10K, I think I know which two I would suggest should be uh, winners uh, too. So, let's, let's get on to this. Seeds and matches, bear that in mind. The first one we're going to talk about, and there's no particular order in, in these, it's not a first, second, third, fourth, um, but we're going to start with the two in Africa and, and then go on to the two in Southeast Asia. The first one in Africa, uh, the award goes to Imong Inayom, who is working with the WCS Cross River Gorilla Project uh, in the Umbe Mountains of Cross River State in Cameroon. Now, I had the good opportunity in 2009 when I was the ambassador for the UN Year of the Gorilla to travel across most of the 10 Gorilla Range states. I didn't get to all of them. I set out with the intention of visiting all of them, and I got to eight of them, and seven of them let me in. So it was a bit of a story. You can find about that if you Google on YouTube State of the Gorilla Journey. You can see a little summary of that. And in that is the closest I ever got to a Cross River Gorilla. I sat in a Cross River Gorilla nest, but it was about three weeks old. Now, the Cross River Gorillas are so endangered, and the hunting is still a real threat to them, that there are attempts not to habituate them. We don't want these gorillas lowering their guard. Keep them scared until such time as they are safe. What is innovative about Imong's role in this, in this project, it's not just that they're using cyber trackers and cool technology to monitor the movements of the gorillas. Some days after the gorillas have passed through, but you, with the nests you can still do that. Um, but it's the fact that it, the Umbe Mountains isn't a national park. It's a community forest. And we've heard it mentioned that there are more great apes living, out, more apes, not just great apes, gibbons and siamangs too, living outside of protected areas and inside them. So this is innovative because it's engaging the community. It's hiring them, teaching them to use cool technology and go out into the forest to monitor what's going on in their forest and receive salaries from conservation work. So this award will go to that, but it recognizes Imong's particularly uh, important contribution to that project, empowering local people. So I'm hoping that that, with the help of WCS and other organizations that might chip in to make it even more effective, will be a seed funding that is not only matched, but nurtured and then enabled to grow into the kind of conservation success we've seen with the mountain gorillas. But every mountain gorilla lives in a protected area, which is also a World Heritage Site. And these gorillas live in a community forest. 
So exciting, innovative conservation involving communities and new technology. So the second African one has a much wider scope. Some of the proposals were very narrow in scope. They were really good for what they were doing for those particular small population or subpopulation of apes. But the reason this one particularly appealed to me is because it has potentially a very wide scope. And that's because the next award winner is uh, Are Emmanuel Enau, who works with the Lager team, the last great ape organization. And uh, Naftali showed you a map earlier of the, um, the distribution of these NGO support uh, groups that are helping the enforcement agencies do their job better with investigations and training and so on. And I had, um, unbeknown to Emmanuel, uh, uh, an email from Ophir Drory, the founder of Lager, which was the first of these now successfully replicated groups under the Eagle Network, um, saying that basically when Ophir is traveling, and he travels a lot because everybody wants a little bit of Ophir. They want his enthusiasm, his dedication to kickstart similar projects in other countries. Who minds the ranch when he's on the road? Emmanuel does. So he's a very important person. When you hear Naftali speak, when you hear Ophir speak, uh, when you hear um, Luke in Gabon speak, you think it's a Mazungu, it's a white guy who's doing it all. But of course, one individual cannot do it. It's teamwork. And when I first saw Lager in action and met the team, there were volunteer students, there were people from all walks of life, there was a high court judge, all who felt that citizen action, getting engaged to fight corruption and ensure that their laws were enforced so that these wildlife crimes didn't go unpunished. That's what makes it a success, not the dedication and vision of the founder, but the building of an effective team of Cameroonian activists, many of whom are unpaid, and yet they're doing dangerous work. So they need some recognition, and I'm very, very happy that we're giving one of these awards to Emmanuel, because it will be noticed in Cameroon, just as Imong's award will be noticed in Nigeria. What These people are being recognized at an international level by a UN body that thinks what they're doing is important. That, for morale, is huge. And I really hope that in both cases, the publicity that we get these people, these important individuals, who are relatively early on in their careers, will give them that kind of boost, enable them to make the most of their talents and skills. I'm a real man of from the last great aid organization. I would like to use this opportunity to thank you for this award. This award will go a long way for strengthening my activities and also to encourage others in the arrest and prosecution of potential ape traders and hunters in carrying out these activities. Laga Wildlife Law Enforcement aims at increasing wildlife law capacity, produce effective deterrent to the killing of great apes and other wildlife and monitoring the illegal wildlife trade and other activities detrimental to the survival of great apes, while also providing a model for similar effort throughout Central and West and Central Africa. I would also like to use this opportunity to thank the entire Laga family for their support and contributions for me to win this award. Once again, I would say thank you. Thank you. We're moving now from Africa to Asia, and the first of the Asian winners uh, works in the Gunung Loiza ecosystem. Uh, his name is Tezar Palevi, and Tezar um, is doing a really exciting and innovative project. It's exciting and innovative because what we were hearing yesterday about the destruction of natural habitat for oil palm plantations suggested that it was a one-way street. Once the forest was gone, that is it. But the Indonesian authorities do recognize that where illegal oil palms have been planted, they should be destroyed if someone has the energy to prove that they're illegal and then organize the destruction. And that's what this project is. It's identified, identified an important corridor of land that links two, bit of the, two bits of the Gunung Loiza ecosystem and it's destroying oil palms that were 
planted illegally, and then replanting natural forest, natural fruit trees. And the suggestion is that within 10, 15 years, there'll be secondary forest that was probably going to be useful enough for many of the species of animals uh, to, to start using. And ultimately, as the trees get bigger, orangutans will be able to pass through. So fighting fragmentation. We've heard it not only is deforestation in general a problem, but fragmentation, splitting up of habitats and therefore of populations, cutting off gene flow between subpopulations is a serious threat. And I'm really excited that Tezar uh, is being recognized by this award. Here he is. Um, I'm sorry we can't get him to thank us in person, but the next one, we do at least have a video thank you uh, from Panut. So the second of the Asian ones is also uh, a Sumatran orangutan field worker. Uh, Panut works on human orangutan conflict resolution. And here I think I'm just going to let him speak for himself because we have this bit of video. Hello. I'm Panut Hadisiswoyo. I'm the founder and director of the Orangutan Innovation Center based in Medan, Sumatra, Indonesia. I'm very pleased and happy to know that we and our team actually uh, get the Ian Vietman Conservation Award. I think it is a special privilege for me. And also, I believe that this, this is one of the most outstanding awards that acknowledge our groundwork to save the remaining orangutan populations in Sumatra. With this award, uh, our Human Orangutan Conflict Response Unit, or HOKRU, will be able to continue to respond to uh, any human orangutan conflict incidents in the field, in the, in the farmland, adjacent to the forest, and also to uh, respond to a uh, report of uh, illegally uh, held captive orangutan, which is quite, uh, quite common in Aceh, and some orangutans, unfortunately, are still in the cage, uh, kept by uh, people illegally. And with the award, uh, our whole group team uh, will be able to conduct uh, uh, monitoring of uh, translocated and isolated uh, orangutans in, in, uh, in the farmland and also try to uh, translocate the orangutans safely based on the you know, uh, uh, high standard to, for the uh, survival and the uh, uh, welfare of the orangutans. And with this uh, award, our team also will be able to continue to conduct uh, monitoring of um, villages that are located adjacent to the forest in order to gain understanding of uh, crop breeding issues and also uh, our team will be able to conduct awareness and um, education for people who live uh, in the farmland and, and have a conflict with the orangutans. Uh, all in all, this award and, and the program of Hope Group will, will actually uh, help, help the, the future of the, the orangutan and I believe and our team believe that there are still hopes for the orangutans and we are the hopes for the survival of the orangutans. Thank you again for your uh, award. So, um, we have four people who I hope will be given a, a little bit of a leg up in what they're doing. Um, I feel very uh, fortunate to be in this position where I'm handing out these awards, uh, and I want to just, just recognize an occasion in my life when two organizations gave me a similar leg up. Um, I've been dotting around conservation and filmmaking and research and this and that for a long time. Um, but around the turn of the century, in the late 90s, more and more reports were coming in suggesting that, that ape numbers were declining, were going down the pan, and we needed to do something. And um, the International Fund for Animal Welfare and the Born Free Foundation decided to put a bit of um, financial and administrative support behind what was then the fledgling Ape Alliance. The Ape Alliance began as a, a loose coalition of NGOs to try and work together on the various issues facing apes. And if you go to fourapes.com, four as a number, apes.com, uh, you'll see the, the different working groups on different issues, producing publications, which we then try and get into the hands of decision makers. And that was having some effect, but it clearly wasn't having enough of an effect. Uh, so in 2000, uh, as Johannes mentioned, uh, I basically doorstepped at the encouragement of one or two other well-placed individuals, uh, the executive director of UNEP, and 
said that he really needed to do something for great apes in the same way that his predecessor had done for rhinos. Uh, Mustafa, uh, Mustafa Tolba, in the early 90s, designated Esmond Bradley Martin as the UN Special Envoy for Rhino Conservation. And don't we on World Rhino Day today need someone like that again? But Esmond said, don't try and get a sit-down sit meeting, it'll never work. Just grab him as he comes out of another meeting. So I did. And he listened to me, and he said, yes, amazing. So out of that conversation, GRASP began. Now, filmmaking had a role to play in that, because it didn't, didn't happen straight away. There were lots of other meetings, me going to UNEP and sitting outside uh, Dr. Topfer's office, hoping for another doorstep opportunity. And they, they probably got a bit fed up with this bloke who kept turning up, hanging around, waiting to talk to the ED. But he had instructed it to happen, so I had some support. Um, and it was because I was helping to make Cousins, a three-part BBC series on primates presented by Charlotte Ullenbrook, that I kept passing through Nairobi. And so it was BBC money that was enabling me to do some conservation work. And out of that um, persistence grew the GRASP partnership, originally de declared in 2001 as a project, and then after the World Summit in 2002, a type two partnership. So GRASP grew, and we, we, we're here with GRASP now. But without that little leg up from iPhone born free to get the Ape Alliance a bit more established, we're, we're still doing as much as we can. Clearly, given the continuing decline of great ape numbers and gibbon numbers, we're not doing enough. So we ain't there yet. There's no room for complacency. But I'm hoping that these four, who knows, if we enable them, give them a bit of seed money, maybe some match funding, seeds and matches can do something like that again. And one benefit of being an award winner that isn't in any of the documents, because we only thought of it yesterday, is to involve this new initiative, which I'm involved with, virtual ecotourism. So if you visit vicotourism.org and click on take a tour and go to Sumatran orangutans, you'll find fairly quickly, there we go, Sumatran orangutans, scroll down, unless you want to listen to the introductory video and you find the map, click on the left hand pano pin. Uh, a pano is short for a spherical panoramic photograph where you take all the way around and over the top and underneath, and then you stitch them together. And if, you, if you, you're looking out over the Tripa peat swamp, as it is now, but if you look down, you will see that we, was, we are standing in an orangutan nest. This was a nest built by an adult male cheek padder, who the team that uh, in Singleton had arranged for me last year to go out with his team, uh, they took me to a little patch of forest less than 100 yards across, a remnant, a pocket handkerchief of forest. And as we walked through the forest, um, we got to see some nests, uh, but not to see the, the animal. But when I saw the nest up in the tree, I felt that I wanted to show you and everyone else online who visits this site what an orangutan feels like when he wakes up. When he was an infant, all that was forest. He spent the first eight years of his life clinging to his mum, clambering through canopy, which is no longer there. Can you st stop there and click on the the canal there. And can we have sound on this one? Because within the panel, within the photograph, there are embedded videos. Indonesia's peat swamps are globally important carbon stores. Lowering the water table like this in a peat swamp allows the peat to rot. So instead of storing carbon, it releases it as carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. This adds to the threat of dangerous climate change. Dry peat is also a fire hazard, and burning peat is not only dangerous, it releases the carbon much faster than by decomposition. Okay, there's lots of little embedded videos, you have to search for them uh, if you're in explore mode, or if you want to be lazy, you just stay in guided mode and it does it all for you. But it's a new form of um, immersive, interactive conservation education tool. If you have headphones on, you're hearing the ambient sound of the forest. When you click, you find out information about what's going on in that forest. And if you zoom, you see in almost every direction, it's oil palm. That's the human orangutan conflict that this award winner, uh, Panut, is tackling. It's scary. And this is in the Gunung Loiza ecosystem, which is supposed to be protected. It's in a peat swamp, which is supposed to not be cleared because of the, the, the peat in it. And yet, it's happening, and Indonesian law seems to be unable to stop it which is very frightening, but at least you can know about it by visiting this. And having, f f if you feel like you've visited there,
perhaps you'll care a little more about it. So the next step is then to guide the virtual ecotourist, the vicotourist, to the organizations like Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program and um, the Human Orangutan Conflict Group um, to support them. So it will, we hope, bring new support to them. And what we decided yesterday was that each award winner would have a Vico tour made of his or her project. So not only would they get a small award, they'd get a platform and some exciting new technology so that people all over the world, and this ultimately we're going to have live, real-time Vico tours. So people will tune in. You might have a class of kids in New York and, a, and a, an evening class in uh, some other country, depending on the time zone. And they, they can all be participating, communicating with the guide who's on, the, on location, answering questions live online. That's, that's the future of Vico tourism, and we hope that you'll be excited, as excited by it as, as I am. And, and having tied it now to these awards, we'll have some new tours uh, so that you can learn more about the projects that these awards are supporting. And that's, I think, about it from me. So thank you for your attention, and I hope you'll... Uh, Join me in, in congratulating the four winners. <laughs>